Good morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a special welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial a Sermon service. Uh, a couple of intimations. You may have noticed the poster as you came in uh, to church this morning, but on Sunday the 3rd of September, we are going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the organ being put into the church. Um, and it being moved, if I remember rightly, from over there somewhere to its present location. So uh, I think it was the 5th of September was the actual, the 2nd, sorry. So we're only even a day out. Um, and we're having a special organ recital. Um, and we are having, if I could find her name, um, Tiffany Vaughan, um, who is the organist, harpsichordist, perhaps you can say that with your teeth out, harpsichordist, or whatever, choral conductor um, of Jordan Hill Parish Church. So she's going to come along in the afternoon um, to uh, play. So I'm sure it will be well worth coming along. Um, if you can speak to Alan and just let him know roughly the numbers uh, of you are coming along, there will be, um, I'm assuming there's refreshments afterwards uh, in the hall. Also a reminder to the session that um, we're having a, a joint afternoon with uh, St. Columbus and St. Andrew's sessions. If you can put your name on the list, please, uh, if you're able to come along to that uh, Sunday afternoon. And I think these are all the intimations. We're going to sit quietly for a moment or two as we think about the people in the Ukraine. And Alan's going to light our candle. Well, up, <laughs> Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Let's worship God as we sing, All My Hope on God is Founded. Let us pray. Sovereign God, we have come to worship you, to declare your faithfulness, to acknowledge your majesty, and to marvel at your love. We're here to rejoice, to bring our thanks, to express our wonder, and to celebrate your goodness. We're here to seek mercy, to confess our mistakes, to recognize our weaknesses, and to ask for your pardon. We're here to pray for ourselves, 
our world and one another. We come to receive, hungry to hear you, thirsting to know you better, longing to be filled. We come to give, to offer our money, our time, and our love in the service of Christ. We come to listen to the message of Scripture, to the words of Christ, and to the inner prompting of your Holy Spirit. We come to speak, to sing your praises, to declare our faith and to make known the gospel. Lord of heaven and earth, receive our praise. And here is now as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the New Testament from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas in prison. Hear the word of God. Once when we were going to the place of prayer... We were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us as Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and, uh, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought him to his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Amen. We sing again, God is our strength and refuge.
over the past few weeks, we have been looking at the New Testament stories. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some of the great Old Testament stories. And I'm using Tom White's book, Gone Your Cell, Moses. <laughs> this is the Was of Jericho. You've maybe perhaps often wondered, and even perchance sometimes doubted, about the wars that fell down outside Jericho Tun when the Jews blew their trumpets and shouted. Well, I've got the true inside story, or just why the wars all fell down. The two major factors were Duff subcontractors and Joshua's choice for a tune. For he tell all the bandsmen to practice, and when they were pitch perfect perhaps, with some help from the Lord they did get the reward, and the Jericho's wars would collapse. Just how a wee toot on the trumpet would achieve this, he didn't quite know. But he just put his trust in the Lord as you must when you face an invincible foe. So here's my wee take on the action, why Jericho's wars hit the flare. I heard it from Danny, who says that his granny was tilted by her Auntie Claire. Though the wars looked quite solid, they weren't they? Because the whole thing was really a sham. The result, so it seems, of Egyptian schemes for a pyramid making marketing scam. For I'm told back in Egypt, old Pharaoh got some of his mafia guys to go out as hunters or gullible punters and sell them a building franchise. But of course, there were no selling nothing, for the whole thing relied on the pitch that the ten mare were needed for each who succeeded, and then everyone would get rich. But the thing about pyramid selling is you finally run out of folk. And the last punters in simply just can't win, so they didn't get rich, they get broke. And that's just what happened to Abdul, the last one to join in the fiddle. He had stars in his eyes in a building franchise, but nobody left for to diddle. Then along came the Jericho contract, so Abdul applied the old savvy, for he quickly reacted and just subcontracted the job to a wee Glasgow navvy. It was Jerry, the bampot for Springburn. A typical Glaswegian dope, whose work up till then was the odd button bend made for chipboard secured with some rope. So his knowledge of fortifications was just slightly less than he haw. But when he had the big time, he set out in jig time, completing the Jericho War. When Abdul arrived for to pay him, he asked him how much had been spent on breeze blocks and bricks and shovels and picks and mortar and sand and cement. Not a penny said wee Glasgow Jerry, and before he could be asked just why, said, I'll no give ye patter, the well had no water, so I just put up the hail wall dry. <laughs> and who ever promised ye breeze brocks? For it's ten to one I never did, because when you're on the bevy, these things are too heavy, so I just built the wall using wood. For Jerry had thrown it together without even a nail or a screw. It was plywood and cardboard and ten tons of hardboard and all just held together we glue. It was then that the Jews came in marching, each one with their tunic and hat on, and Joshua at front with a yell and a grunt gain at Laldi and twirling his baton. When the folks in the tune heard the trumpets, well, everyone came run an hour, and they all started swaying when the band started playing that great Irish song, The Wild Rover. When they got to the bit, no, nay, never, then all together they clapped their hands. And the reverberations destroyed the foundations, and the war fell to bits on the sand. So that is why Jericho perished, and why all that blood there was spilt. It was not just the fanfare that killed every one there, but the Jerry built was Jerry built. And if you doubt that there's truth in this nonsense, just look up a Greek and play index, and you'll see that it's stated this tale is related in a wee play called Edifice Rex. But of course you all ken that I'm joking. And this stuff about Jerry's pure, pure lies. But the wars did fall down when the Jews played their tune. For the truth, you can never disguise. And you can't keep out the Almighty. We are war no matter how strong. If you've got only sense, then you think that a fence will protect you when you're in the rang. But if you want to make some sweet music, join the Lord's band and don't be afraid. See your past life, just dump it and pick up your trumpet and join the Almighty's parade. But when you're on the march with God's army, then you go getting cocky or prude, for it's much more effective to keep your perspective than you blow your own trumpet too loud. We sing again.
in heavenly love abiding. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The challenges which faced the first century Christians like Paul are in comparison child's play to the issues that we face. In 2023, we have the toughest job ever of keeping the ideals of Christianity and in faith in particular alive. The mess and apathy and opposition that we have to face is far greater now than at any other time in the history of the world. And do you know what is the most frustrating and infuriating thing of all? That when many of our so-called critics actually make the effort to come and experience what it is we have to offer, they leave having enjoyed the experience and feeling the better for it. Yet despite all the problems that we face, God still promises us that if we are faithful to him and if we are obedient to his will, then we will be, over, we, we will be victorious. We will overcome all that confronts us. Where does this confidence come from? Well, the Bible is full of examples of God overcoming seemingly impossible circumstances. What about the birth of Jesus? What an incredible story that was. Everything was against the birth of Jesus. Joseph was going to divorce Mary, but he didn't. There was no room at the bed and breakfast, but they found a cave. The outcast shepherds came to see the baby, and the unnumbered wise men traveled for many months to find the newborn king. Despite everything being against it, the birth of Jesus happened, because that was God's plan. But the example I want to remind you of today is that of Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Joshua is one of my favorite Old Testament characters. He was a great general. And under Moses, he had led the Israelite army to many victories. But now he was in charge. 
And he was landed with the hardest task that any general could ever have faced. He had to take the city of Jericho because it controlled the gateway to the promised land. As long as the city remained intact, the people of Israel would never enter into their inheritance. The words of verse 1 in chapter 6 tell us how strongly fortified the city was. Now Jericho was shut up from within and from without. None went out and none came in. In other words, the city was secure, well fortified, and would have tested the ingenuity of any general to find a military solution to this great problem. It would have taken months, maybe even years, to lay siege to the city, as conventional military methods would have suggested. But Joshua wasn't just a military leader. He was also the spiritual leader of the people. Joshua was a man of faith. And so he turned to God for guidance on how the city should be taken. And here is where we find out just how great a leader Joshua was. Because the answer that God gave him would have tested the faith of any man. Instead of a military solution, God gave Joshua a spiritual one. He told him to march around the city once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day to march around the city seven times. And then to tell the people to give a loud shout. Do that and you have the victory, said God. You can imagine how Joshua must have felt. Look God, this is one of the best defended cities in the world. And you want me to march around the walls blowing a trumpet. Come on, this is the 16th century BC that we're living in. Things don't happen that way anymore. And yet, that is exactly what Joshua did. Despite his military background, he trusted God because he had learned that God, Moses had trusted God before him. And so he called the people together. And he told them what God wanted and he made all the arrangements. And the seven priests blew the seven trumpets. The armed men walked ahead and behind the priests along with the Ark of the Covenant. And for seven days... They did exactly what God had commanded, right down to the last detail. The city of Jericho was to be taken by faith and obedience, not by the world's wisdom or might. Joshua walked in faith. And the use of the number seven is a further clue to the real purpose of this story. Seven was the number which symbolized perfection in Jewish thought. Seven days of creation, seven days of the week, and so on. It's mentioned some 14 times in the passage and would seem to suggest that this story is all about the covenant relationship between God and his people. The fact that they were asked to march around the city for seven days is meant to be a test of their faith, of their trust in God. What counts is not how the city was to be destroyed, but that the people of Israel were willing to do as God commanded, no matter how daft or ineffectual it might seem. The second clue to the importance of the story is that the Ark of the Covenant, the box which contained the tablets on stone on which the Ten Commandments were written, was to be carried with them. In other words, it was the presence of God that gave the people the victory. Wherever God is, Victory is assured. Joshua, for all that he was a military man, knew that. And he was aware that as long as his eyes were fixed on God, that no matter how daft or how silly God's commands might seem to be, the only way forward was in faith and obedience. And the result of their obedience? The city fell, just as God had promised. Just as an aside... There are two suggestions that have been given as to what actually did cause the walls to fall. The first was that the marching around the walls was meant to hide the fact that the Israeli sappers were tunneling under the foundations to make them unstable. That's highly unlikely, as it would have taken more than a week for such a job to be completed. The second suggestion being that an earthquake destroyed the walls. A bit too much of a coincidence, if you ask me. 
but it's not how the walls felt that counts. What's important is the faith of the people and of Joshua. The purpose of marching around the city was to test that faith. Jericho, despite being a major stumbling block to the hopes of the Israelites, fell because of their faith and trust in the will of God. So there's much for us to learn from that story today. Jericho was a daunting problem to Joshua. As seemingly unstoppable, the decline of the world is a problem to the present day church. What we must keep at the forefront of our minds is that what we are doing in church today is what God wants us to do. He wants his people to come together to worship. He wants us to pray and to sing and to listen to his word. And it might not seem that our worship is making a great impact in the world, but we need to remember what Paul and Silas did in the face of trial. They sang hymns of praise to God. And as a result, the doors of their prison flew open and their chains fell off. Why did they do it? Because God told them that's what he wanted them to do. Today, we could easily say to God, look God, this is 2023. Nobody goes to church anymore. Can you not think of something more dramatic or inspiring that will change the hearts and minds of people so that we might find it easier to believe? that your kingdom will be fully established. But you see, if we start, start to think that way, then we're missing the point of coming to church. We come to church and we act as we do because we believe that is what God wants us to do. Just as Paul and Silas believed that God commanded them to sing in prison, and just as God ordered Joshua to march around the city blowing a trumpet, it doesn't matter whether we think it will work. We do it because God wants us to do it that way. So as long as we come to church, we will never feel far from the presence of God. And that will help us to keep trusting and obeying His commands. And as we face up to the huge problems that confront our world, we do well to remember the story of Jericho and the actions of Paul and Silas. Because we too are having our faith tested. Of course, it would be easier if God acted right now and put us out of our misery. But remember, it took the Israelites 40 years in the wilderness and seven days of marching before God acted. So we too must be patient and faithful and obedient. It's all very well to believe that God can act and change things. But we must also trust that he will act in his own time, the right time. And there's a difference between believing and trusting. There is a story told of a party who visited the Royal Mint. And during the trip, the guide told the party that if someone was to place their hand in a barrel of water and then remove it from the water that the hand could be dipped into the molten metal used to make the coils, coins without burning it. Would you like to try, sir? The guide asked one man. No, thank you, said the man. I'll take your word for it. I believe you. The man's wife stepped forward and offered her hand and the experiment took place safely. The difference was the man might well have believed, but his wife trusted. If the church is to overcome the trials and tribulations that it faces in the world today, then each of us must believe, but we must also trust. No matter how daft or how ineffectual we think an action might be, if God commands, we must obey, just as Joshua obeyed. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, the people raised a great shout, and the walls fell down flat. Do as God commands, and we shall overcome, and we will have the victory. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts this morning. Let's worship God with our offering.
Let us pray. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Father, in your love for us, you bless us every day. And so today we bring a token of our love and appreciation before you, asking that you would accept them, bless them, and use them, that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayers for other people. Let us pray. Loving God, we bring to you our world of so much pain, so much need and sorrow. A world you care for deeply, that you willingly gave your all for it, living and dying among us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Reach out again in mercy and heal our wounds. We bring to you the causes of so much suffering, the sin of greed, denying the many their share of this earth's riches to the benefit of the few, the sin of waste, wantonly squandering the resources you have given with no thought of future generations, the sin of intolerance, dividing families, communities, and nations through a refusal to engage in dialogue, the sin of pride, thinking too highly of ourselves and too poorly of others, the sin of indifference, caring too little about you, too little about anything. Each act out of mercy and heal our wounds. We pray for those who pay the price of human folly, the poor and the hungry, the homeless and dispossessed, victims of war and violence, crime and cruelty, the distressed, isolated, crushed and forgotten, all who are deprived of love and denied hope. Act out again in mercy and heal our wounds. Loving God, come again to our world through your Son, our Savior. Mend our divisions, forgive our folly, and guide all our affairs. Reach out again in mercy and heal all our wounds. In the name of Christ we ask it. Amen. And I remind the elders of the list in the vestibule and we close singing for I'm building a people of power and we'll sing it through twice. And may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love, now and evermore.
God bless and keep safe.